Another topic is about the sources of African Christian theology. Uh, there are many sources, but Bible is the first major source that we can talk about. And Bible becomes a very critical source because uh, African Christian theology claims to be a Christian theology, and no Christian theology can be there without the Bible. Now, in Africa, we have over 2,000 ethnic uh, communities, or some call them tribes, but that's an insult. It should be, because it means primitive people. Uh, I should say there are over 2,000 ethnic groups in Africa. And over 50%, they have Bible translated in their languages, meaning Bible is the most read book. It has a starting point, even when you are doing political, social rallies, even in other ceremonies and other rituals that are not necessarily Christians, we must find ourselves mentioning the Bible. And again, many schools belong to the missionaries and who want to introduce the Bible to our forefathers, our parents. And so they spoke to us using biblical uh, idioms. You can hear your parents telling you, uh, be a good Samaritan, not a good African. Bible is a major source. It's a major source because even when we read it, we find stories that resonate with the African context. Like uh, when somebody talks about the, the Egyptian dictatorship, we have Africa has gone through dictatorships, debt, debt cancelling. There's a lot of issues in Africa requiring that. The, even uh, the Bible talks about uh, Jubilee, we have issues in Africa that come across that, that are in tandem with that. When they talk of, of hunger, injustice, social injustice like in the Book of Amos, these stories are there in Africa even before the coming of Christianity in the 19th century. So that's the first source. The second source I want to consider, I want to mention briefly African cultural and religious heritage as another source of African Christian theology. Now, you remember, uh, culture has six pillars that are major pillars. Of course, there are many, but I should mention them. One pillar is politics. That is the way people are governed. The other one is economics, how people distribute resources. That is my simple definition. The other one, the third one is ethics. That is uh, the morality of the people. And the other one is aesthetics, or how people address the issues of sense of splendor, beauty, and all that. Uh, the other one is kinship, of course, which regulates marital family relationships within a community. And the other one, the number six, is religion, which is a synthesis of perspectives to produce a possible worldview, and which binds on and, and uh, brings the community together. At a personal level, religion is how one sums up, sums up his or her being in the world. That is how one accounts for his or her being in the world. So what I'm saying is uh, African religion, African cultural, cultural and uh, religious heritage embraces all pillars of culture. If African religion embraces all pillars of culture, politics, economics, ethics, aesthetics, kinship, religion. It means uh, it takes the entire life of a person. And anyone who is doing Christian theology, Islamic theology, or doing African economics, or anything African, one has to take all these pillars of culture to be successful. If we work with one pillar of culture, we'll fail, because uh, African religion and uh, it's like the way of life, and it goes with the culture of the people. Hence, it's no longer Af not just African culture, but African heritage. Uh, I should hasten to say that uh, acknowledging African cultural and religious heritage as a major source of African theology or African Christian theology implies that the Christian gospel has to combine with some cultural practices without yielding itself to syncretism. It therefore means that African Christianity appreciates 
the richness of African cultural practices, including our proverbs, our myths, our riddles, our African experiences, our songs, our vibrant dances, our prayers, all this. This appreciation of the African cultural and religious heritage is a move nearer to ones making the Christian gospel authentically African. Hence, responding to the challenging question, has Africa made a real claim to Af on Christianity? Has Africa made a real claim on Christianity? That cannot happen unless we appreciate the idioms of Africa, the rich proverbs of Af the rich myths, the rich narratives of Africa in our Christian discourses. Has Africa Africanized Christianity by embracing some of its rich cultural elements, such as the dance, as I've noted, drama, ideas, proverbs, and our language, beautiful languages of mother tongues? But this again drives us to the African theology of inculturation, where African culture and the gospel of Christ are in endless dialogue. The third uh, source I want to rush, uh, rush on and uh, say it is the coming of Christianity in the 19th century. Of course, we must appreciate that uh, we don't know what we can be talking about in the name of African Christian theology without the coming of uh, the 19th and 20th century missionaries to Africa. There are complaints like some cooperate too much with the colonizers. But you see, that is the only way they could have survived in a foreign land. They needed the railway, they needed the roads, they needed security from some wild animals, some uh, hostile communities sometimes, who didn't understand, despite the hospitality of the African people, there was still pocket of hostility on some who were incited on this or the other. And so the coming of Christianity in the 19th century is a major source because it's from there that uh, we start critiquing uh, the way the gospel was presented in order to make an African Christianity. The fourth one is African institutes and churches. The churches such as Karinga churches that came out, that uh, came out as sect from the, the so-called missionary churches in 1929 and 1930, particularly in central Kenya, due to issues of polygamy, issues of female circumcision, as they were protesting the European missionaries' uh, tough stand that some things would not be tolerated and no dialogue was entertained, so they were a bit rough, okay, it was okay, but the issue was there wasn't dialogue. There is also a Corino churches who are close to that. There is also African Orthodox churches. There is AIPCA, African Independent Pentecostal Church of Africa. All these churches are instituted churches. People who are from the mainland churches, they were not comfortable with the way the European missionaries were running these churches. Sometimes they could not tell the difference between the missionaries and the colonizers because some were rough, very rough, very tough, the fifth point is Pan-African, Pan-Africanist movement. Pan-Africanism is another source of African Christian theology. It is derived from the Greek word pan, meaning all. Pan-African therefore means all African. Interestingly, the first form of Pan-Africanism was concerned with the black communities of African ancestry, most of who lived in North America and Caribbean, that's West Indies. This implies that Pan-Africanism can be traced back to the period of African slavery and the European slave trade when ships shuttled between Africa, Europe, America, and the West Indies carrying human cargo for over 200 years. Now, Pan-Africanist movement can also be referred to as a back, the Back to Africa movement that sprang up in the United States of America Brazil and Caribbean during the early 19th century. This movement conceived Africa as a nation, as one nation whose sociocultural problems needed to be addressed in terms of Pan-Africanist thinking. 
Apart from slavery, the Back to Africa movement called for the removal of colonialism in Africa by identifying a theological movement with the Pan-Africanism of politicians such as Marcus Garvey, Henry Sylvester Williams, W.E.B. Du Bois, Breeden and others, and of course Kenyatta and Nkrumah came later, particularly the 1945 Man Manchester Conference, where Kenyatta was a chairman and Nkrumah was the secretary. The first time black people from Africa itself chaired this meeting, we must clearly see it as a unity movement which sought to bring the people of Africa together and identify them as one people of God, regardless of their status, their background, their religion, their gender, and political affiliation. This political conscious movement also had a huge inspirational role to Africans who were in European red churches and their heroic quest for African identity and, and, and uh, dignity continues to inspire African Christianity right into the 21st century. Of course, if you remember the 1945 Man Manchester Conference where Kenyatta, Jomo Kenyatta was the chairman and Nkrumah was the secretary of that very successful meeting, uh, Matthew 6, that the three was corrupted and uh, the theme of the conference was now first seek the political kingdom, other things will come later. If you want our cultural dignity, your human dignity, Africa dignity, fight for freedom first. Fight colonialism, every other thing will come. So that is a very inspiring even to Christians in this, the so-called uh, missionary churches, some of whom felt they were nobody, they were useless in those churches. They felt they were not respected enough. Uh, okay, so that's a major source, Pan-Africanism. Of course, with Pan-Africanism, brought a sixth one, uh, African nationalism. Pan-Africanism inspired uh, African to start their quest for independence in the various countries of Africa. Even if they are not part of the Pan-African movement, Pan-Africanism movement, they went to their countries and became, some became national leaders or nationalistic cause for freedom uh, were all over Africa because of the inspiration from it. In turn, just as, as in the former, uh, it also inspired uh, Christianity in Africa, the mood of the way African Christianity, Christianity should be, and uh, there are quite a number of issues we can talk about. Another source is our Africa Conference of Churches. We can trace the, form, the formation of the AACC in 1963 by addressing the political events of the time. From the close of the World War II, that is 1939 to 45, until 1964, then the nationalist struggles against colonial regimes were accelerated. And by 1965, most African countries had become republics, except the Portuguese ruled colonies of Angola, Mozambique, Guinea-Bissau, and Cape Verde. Spanish colonies also, such as Spanish Equatorial Guinea, Spanish Sahara, Southern Rhodesia, South Africa, and Southwest Africa. Most African states had changed their, their names. For example, Southern Rhodesia is today Zimbabwe, or Southwest Africa is today Namibia. Uh, with the Second Vatican Council of the Catholic Church, the so-called Vatican II, 1962 to 1965, lifting the ban against interaction with the non-Roman Catholic Christians, the Roman Catholic Church and Protestant theologians uh, you can call it AACC, moved together on convergent lines to once acknowledging the need for an African theology. Moreover, the ecumenical cooperation was within the larger framework of a common, of a communion of third world theologians. Seen from this perspective, moratorium was a radical step 
proposed for the realization of African identity and by implication also for the formulation of its own theology. Of course, even the time by the time AACC was formed in, formed in Kampala in 1863, that is the, the All Africa Conference of Churches, there were still European expatriates leading the show. But of course, having lived in Africa, having seen the political trends, they were also less tough, less theologically biased, and they could now give room for more discussion on the progression of African Christianity. Uh, AACC remains a very strong force even today. We can remember that in 1990, during the All Africa Conference of Churches, that is when Professor Mugambi called for a shift of theological paradigms from the concept of liberation to the emphasis on the concept of reconstruction, following Nehemiah's uh, building uh, project in Jerusalem after the Babylonian, uh, uh, Babylonian exile. And uh, that has carried the day. In fact, in 2008, uh, 2000 and, uh, later on, not necessarily 2008, um, the All Africa Conference of Churches used the same theme, let us now be based on Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 18, in their conferences, meaning the theme of reconstruction that was first spoken during the Nairobi meeting of that March 1992. Uh, to give the, and give birth to the theology of reconstruction uh, actually came from there. Meaning AACC has a, is a powerful theological voice in Africa to date. Another very critical and uh, we may consider the last uh, source, the ninth one for today is the Christian tradition. You remember Professor Beatty says we are, province, we are theologically uh, provincial or contextual, but we are charismatically, charismatically universal. Uh, so theologically, we theologize from our own situations and the context. But when it comes to apostolic proclamation, in Greek we call it kerygma, we are universal. We follow in the apostolic succession. We are not inventing our own Christianity in Africa we are still within the apostolic succession and the historicity that goes with it. The issue is Africa is trying to own the gospel, make Christianity their own religion, make it reach the heart and soul of the African people, make it authentic, authentic African religion. There's nothing else. It is not a question of defection. The African people are not seeking to secede or they are not uh, sectarian theologians but they are within the catholicity of theology uh, the catholicity of kerygma but within the contextuality of theology otherwise if we don't appreciate the catholicity of uh, proclamation and uh, and the the contextuality of theologizing we could be saying we all should theologize like people in Europe or, China, or, or, or rather God of Europe is superior to the God of China or God of America or you know it's one God but in terms of receiving our revelation and appropriating it and uh, it cannot be the same everywhere otherwise if you uniformize it by telling us let us worship God in the Western way if you don't jump, you don't kneel, you don't close your eyes. Uh, you know, if we put people in one box, definitely that would mean we could not be serving one God, but one God will allow us to worship him in diversity and plurality as God's economy for the world. God loves plurality. God loves diversity, and he created it. The rivers, the seas, the animals that don't look alike, but they are all important. The many different flowers, in this world. That's a God of uh, diversity, God of plurality. That's the way of God. So we worship God in diverse way, but the Christian tradition, which and people such as the church fathers, you may refer to St. Augustine, Cyprian, Taturion, they are the actual founders of African theology. 
And this means African Christians are part of the apostolic succession and don't practice their Christian faith from their contextual underpinning and are not sectarians or deserters from the Christian faith. They follow in the apostolic traditions in the history of the church. Now, the Christian tradition is a major source of African Christian theology as we are theologically provincial as I've, I'm now summarizing or contextual but charismatically universal. Indeed, Trinity or the concept of the triune God is for all Christians in Africa, Europe, or any other place. The doctrine of the Trinity, which was formulated and established in the great councils in, in the fourth and fifth centuries, is central to the fundamental beliefs, fundamental beliefs of, Christ, of Christianity globally, and Africa is not an exception. Now, these great councils refers to the councils of Chalcedon, the councils of Nicaea, which affirmed the true Christian doctrine as opposed to heretical groups such as Arianism, Donatism, Pelagianism, eh? some of which denied the divinity of Christ. Certainly, God is confessed as Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. There are three persons, persons at the age. It's only one God. This central belief in the true God is clearly expressed in the apostolic and Nisan creeds. Around this central belief, there are other beliefs which are largely an attempt to make the cardinal affirmation of the creeds clearer. This implies, this implies that African theology subscribes to the apostolic and Nisan creeds as formulated in the Christian tradition. This also shows that Apart from seeking to reflect upon the Christian faith with regard to the African context by spicing Christianity with the richness of Afri African culture, it addresses the social realities facing Africa. Now, African theology or African Christian theology is no different from other Christian theologies, such as Western theology, in that commonalities far, far outweigh any points of departures. Thank you very much.